about um, social media um, and sort of uh, the work that we've done at the VCCC Alliance uh, to basically sort of unpick why, you know, some of the areas that social media wasn't quite hitting the mark. So um, I will start by with an acknowledgement of country, um, just noting that the VCCC Alliance acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we carry out our work, and that's throughout Victoria. We recognise and value their continual cultural heritage, beliefs, and deep connection with land and waters. So I just want to start really with a, I'll, I'll give a little bit, a bit of a background um, of the VCCC Alliance to those um, that uh, don't know it. So the VCCC Alliance is obviously, as you can see there, it's a beautiful building, it's beautiful inside and out. Um, but we're also an alliance of 10 different organisations, and I'll touch on those shortly, that really come together uh, to improve the lives of those affected by cancer. Um, our primary um, aim really is, uh, and because of our funding, is, is that that is Victoria, but we also hope, obviously, that those uh, impacts go, um, you know, cross borders um, throughout Australia and internationally. Um, so we currently undertake programs of work that really focus on uh, research, uh, education, health equity. Um, and on the right of this slide, you can see what is our strategy on a page. Lots and lots of words. Um, don't worry too much about it. But the bit I really want to bring everybody's attention to is the bit right at the top. And that's just this focus that we, what we try and do is make our work patient-centered, bold for all and also this notion of being better together. Um, so this is a, a fairly busy slide um, that really sort of says in the top, over in the uh, top left is the, the 10 organisations that we're primarily associated with. These are our alliance organisations, Peter Mac, Royal Melbourne, University of Melbourne, Women's WeHi, the Children's Western Health, St Vincent's, MCRI and Austin. But as you can see there, we also have a lot of other collaborating partners um, and, a lot of, and a lot of that is regional. It's also worth noting that, you know, this is a um, some partners which, and, and it's obviously ever growing. Um, and obviously the one to point out is the one in the bottom right, which is AC Tech, or even when it was VC Tech, it wasn't really there when we started this program of work. So we continue to grow and continue to bring people along with us. And the way that we do that is really through a collective impact model. I'm not sure how many people are aware of that. I think the diagrams at the bottom and the one over on the right really sort of um, explain it uh, better than me. But the bit to really point out is that, uh, that, so the collective impact approach is really where a network of community members, organizations and institutions advance equity by learning together and from each other and achieve population and system change. And that collective impact approach calls for all those involved to abandon individual agendas um, in favor of a common agenda. And that is also another, a much nicer way of saying that we don't want to duplicate effort. And I think we've always got that back to the funding a bit that, that you know, the, the Department um, of Health in Victoria don't want to see us duplicate effort either. So we really try and come and um, do something bold, do something individual, bring people along with us. Um, and then this is just another sort of representation of where the VCCC Alliance sits with that. We're obviously in a sense, we're in the center um, and we, we have that ability to draw people in, um, use their influence and they can use our influence. So sometimes we're in the center of that um, and otherwise we're sort of what we call a backbone um, organization. Uh, where we can sort of, you know, continue to support people and have maximum impact. So that's really um, sort of what the VCCC Alliance does. As Gordon um, uh, mentioned, I oversee two programs. What I'm going to be talking about today is um, what sits in one of those programs, and that's a clinical trial innovation. Clinical trial innovation is uh, itself has four sub projects. Very briefly. Over on the right, there are two projects about enhancing workforce and business capability. Um, they are chaired by Marion Lischke, who I'm sure many on this call would know, um, who's the 
manager of PCCTU at Peter Mac. Um, and that really sort of helped. Uh, so that's sort of lots of programs to try and um, support and enhance a, you know, a clinical trial workforce. Then the two over on the left is about ex getting more patients on trials. And we do that you know, in a pragmatic sense um, through registry trials, but also the other um, one which I got highlighted there, which is about improving trial participation. There's a number of projects that we have there, including um, working with CTIQ for the Beyond the Form project, but we've also done lots of other um, little projects about understanding what we can do to make more people aware of trials. And that's obviously um, where the social media uh this that project um or this project will sit so this is the sort of stuff saying you know why did we do this it's a really important question i think just to start at the very beginning you know i think we're all well aware that patient recruitment remains a huge problem you know there's this statistic that always you know that people talk about 90 to 20 percent of trials that actually close because of poor recruitment but i think that belies the uh, the bigger impact which is that many more are affected by that um that recruitment it uh, or you know they might not close but, you know just having that sluggish recruitment and those trials that end up effectively becoming the unloved trials and just hang around you know that's not great um, that really knocks the confidence of an investigator, especially if they're a new investigator. Um, there are huge unnecessary costs to cite. That can, you know, you try and reinvigorate a protocol by having an amendment. There's a cost impact to that. There's a time impact. Obviously, for you guys in um, in uh, Atrex, um, and there's obviously those other ethical considerations. I mean, there's unnecessary risk to patients if the trial closes. Um, but it also really just impacts on that general idea of what we I call there the lofty progression of science, but it's really that um, the overall impact of research. So some real problems there, and they sort of you know they are better addressed by you know by better recruitment. I've looked at quite a lot of um, uh, a lot of investigator initiated trials, and there's that real um, you know, you can draw a line that, you know, if a trial doesn't recruit in the first three months, it's unlikely to recruit in the next three months. If it hasn't recruited in six months, it's very unlikely, it's less likely to recruit in the next six months. So you've really got to sort of get out there straight out the, um, you know, the starting blocks and start recruiting and get everybody aware of your trial. But it's also worth mentioning that, you know, advertising uh, in clinical trials is not new. Um, you know, lots of pictures at the top there. Um, sponsors of, have often sent out flyers for sites to use to promote their studies. It's, I don't think it's something that we have a great appetite for um, in Australia, to be honest, this idea of putting a lot of things in the waiting rooms, not in the cancer hospital I've been at anyway. But, you know, we have been aware of, of advertising cl in clinical trials. Um, and these traditional methods, um, however, are fairly static. Um, and they're known to us, but social media is still relatively new. I mean, the graph down there shows us that we've all been playing around on Facebook for, for you know, probably a good 10 years now, um, but it is still growing and, um, you know, continues to have influence and other social media sites are added, um, you know, uh, to that, um, that number. So, what we really sort of had this um, the, this question was was you know are people really aware of how to utilize um, uh, social or advertising in social media? And it's also can be argued that a lot of the guidance around clinical trial um, and there is some out there from the FDA and the TGA and you know GCP and dare I say a lot of that has not actually really kept um, kept up even stuff in the national statement you know a lot of the talk of social media is fairly general um, and it doesn't really give any sort of concrete guidance to people who actually want to um, uh, to use it. So it's curious on one side of things we're told that you know it's similar to um, you know or, or you know uh, social media is different but there's not a lot of guidance on saying how it's different. Um, so you know this again is just a slide that you know sort of says 
the other thing when you look at a, a bit of stuff out there on on social media um and advertising it seems to promise everything you know social media it's got it's incredibly cheap to do cheaper than you know putting uh those um, adverts on buses um they'll tell you it's effective they can tell you you can really target um certain uh certain um certain groups but it's also the other thing to to note is that social media advertising there is a lot of work involved um and it that might not that's not necessarily clearly explained um and that may well just be about who moderates sites as simple as that um but there's also sometimes not it's not that clear about how you can end up with these what we call false positives so a lot of people that you know can come to you um you know because they've seen an advert but actually they might not necessarily be eligible so anyway, the point of that is that, you know, we promise so much, but it might not deliver. Um, so with all that in mind, our hypothesis really was a simple one. It was we thought if we can improve the understanding of the use of social media, then we can improve clinical trial recruitment. To do that, we really did start at, um, at, the, base, uh, at the basics. We did a, some scoping work. We used our working group members. Um, used to picked on them as subject matter experts. Um, we contacted a number of stakeholders and people again that I've been involved with um, over the years to really sort of understand that you know the landscape and limitations of some of the work that I've alluded to already. Um, and then we can say, what did we find? Well, to be perfectly honest, I think you know pretty blunt. I would say, uh, and again, as I've alluded to. The messaging around social media was mixed and we looked at this from the standpoint of if you're a clinician researcher and you wanted to engage in social media and you know you've been um, told it's going to really help you know what um, decent information was there that could really support you in that the first thing um, to notice as i've met, um, uh, mentioned briefly earlier there's a lot of this information was actually surprisingly out of date uh, even on an FDA website, they talk about, you know, the, some of their references was talking about a public hearing that they had in 2009, which in any age um, is a long time ago and in, in a digital age um, is, is a very long time ago. The resources, um, again, also, you know, in, even in the, in the national statement, you know, their, their mention of social media was very brief. Much advice out there was all about making social media effective. For example, you know, how you could target an audience, but it didn't really say a lot more than that. Um, much of the information was useful, again, only to a point. It was suggested if you wanted to advertise, then you should use your, um, and if you wanted to advertise on your health institution's website, then you should go and get their permission. And I think that's a fairly introductory amount of um, you know information. It didn't go you know a lot of it didn't go very f a lot further than that. And then there was this. Um, it was quite interesting that um, a lot of this, a lot of the stuff out there, alluded to this idea of a social media plan. And I've put it down there as an enigma of a social media plan. Um, it was something that is you know quite a lot of literature talks about it. But I asked a lot of people and nobody could ever find one. And in fact, it doesn't, it's effectively doesn't exist. So it's an idea, it's a concept, but it's there's there's nothing to, that we could use and put forward um, as an example. So essentially, from a researcher's point of view, there wasn't a lot of uh, a lot of support. So that's effectively what we would call this knowledge gap. You know, what was available and what was needed. And the way we looked at this is actually. That we thought that you know the pivotal people in this, the people who where the researchers often go for that advice, um, was were were the HRECs. and so we sort of wanted to create a resource that would help everybody, but sort of help um, help with that bridge between what was available and what was needed. And it's worth mentioning that as we were looking at this, and it's, this is if we can look at a date in there, it was January two thousand and twenty, so twenty two, so about a year ago. Um, all of a sudden there was a googly um the meta ban uh talked about there was this uh there would be a ban on clinical trial recruitment um anything that directly targeted 
um, populations. And I just want to put it out there because I know that some people were vaguely aware of it. I think it's quite curious, the people I've spoken to, it's one of those things that was talked about, but it hasn't actually seems to have, um, you know, squashed anything. So, yeah, I just thought it, well, I'd put it out there because it was something that threw us for a while. And then we realized that there wasn't, didn't seem to be a lot of um, basis in it. It was a bit of a curiosity. So when we looked at all this, um, uh, we really sort of went back to basics. Um, we thought about what we really wanted to provide for the, for the clinician researchers. Um, essentially, the number one bit was to make sure that the information that we were providing was um, was up to date and would it be able to support investigators and by extension, the HREX themselves in improving communication between the two. Um, looking Using the usual hierarchy of information, we understood that there were things that we can control or we, things that we can influence and there are things that we can't influence. So, for example, procedures or procedure um, you know, we, we can influence, but things we can't was maybe be an institution's own um, policy or SOP. However, if we have a, um, a you know, an FAQ and a procedure, that is something that, you know, they might be able to build upon and, and, and put into their SOP. But we're not able to come and, you know, dictate anybody's SOP. We wanted to provide researchers with information that HREX required. Um, and, and that's the bit that would really support them. Um, but and, and with that, we wanted to provide the why. If you get that why right, why are we, um, why do you have to provide this information? Then, you know, that really, that, that uh, builds understanding. So that led to the development of an FAQ um, and a guidance procedure. And like I say, but not the policy or, and, and not the SOPs. Um, and we're also conscious that creating additional resources, um, you know, around uh, could be um, counterproductive. And that really went back to this idea of this social media plan. If it was something that didn't necessarily really exist, we don't really want to create, you know, create something. We realized that the, um, a lot of the guide, some of the guidance outside of a FAQ and a procedure should really be in the protocol. The, you know, in protocols, there's already mention of recruitment strategies. So that's actually where we should provide the guidance on where that should be. And then the next bit that we really, we talked about and, and realized that, you know, again, this is idea of this influence. What are the, what are the, how can you influence certain projects? And what I mean by that is there is a distinction between um, investigator initiated studies and those commercially sponsored studies. So if we're, when we're communicating with HREX, you know, you could put um, certain things into a protocol with an IIT study if a researcher has sort of written, effectively written the, the protocol themselves. But if they're actually just taking on board and want to do a uh, use social media recruitment in um, for a commercially sponsored study that they can't really, um, you know, alter the protocol for, we can support that through um, you know, so, uh, getting some information and putting it in there um, as an appendix. So um, what we also wanted to do was you know, in, uh, have a document where it, it's the one in the middle there called a planning template. And that's where you really sort of gather all the information that HREX needed. Um, and, and by doing that, you sort of were able to um, move away from some common pitfalls that researchers made when they were communicating their social media recruitment strategies. So with help from Heidi, um, uh, who I'm sure a lot of you know over at the Austin, um, like I said, we, we, we discussed this enigma of the social media plan and realized we would, wouldn't go down that path. We would put the, um, all of this into um, supporting pro, um, protocols. Um, so here is a uh, example of what those resources look like. Over on the left is that sort of planning requirement. So you would do this if you were um, either for an IIT study or if it would be for a, um, uh, as an appendix uh, for a protocol. And that's, you can see there, it's sort of saying which, you know, which platform do you use? Um, you know, when you talk about the clinical trial start dates, um, your budget, it's really just, collecting that information. 
then as you go across, there's uh, uh, the appendix, if you use it as an appendix, or there's um, a template there, a protocol template, and you can put that information direct, or investigative researchers can, can put that um, information directly into the protocol. Um, this is a quick example of a, uh, an F the FAQ document. The FAQ is really just a quick reference guide. As it says there, it covers the basics. We've got a comparison table in there that compares traditional advertising to social media advertising. Um, and the audience really is just researchers and anybody who's just a, you know, a little bit interested um, around this. Um, but it's a fairly simple document. Um, and then a more detailed version of that is the guidance um, procedure. Um, the audience is much more for researchers and, and you know, it really outlines, yeah, as it says there, the background, the purpose, um, responsibilities, um, and it really sort of goes in much more into the nuts and bolts of, um, uh, of the purpose of the social media guidance. Um, and as we hope it would uh, be lifted and, and, and used to support SOPs and policies. So that really goes on to the next step. You know, I think we've, uh, I'm currently at a, uh, another conference, an actor that some of you are maybe popping along to. Everybody talks about amazing research and they've done amazing research and then the tricky bit is to actually implement it. Um, you know, we've we've done all this work. We've, um, you know, we're, we're happy and proud of the work. Um, we've put it onto our uh, website. Um, we know that it gets some hits, and I'll talk to uh, next slide about those. Um, we're going out there, and we are talking at conferences, obviously including this one. Um, we have got a uh, we put this um, into abstracts and put it into uh, posters at conferences, and we've been able to speak to people directly about um, about this initiative. Um, it'd be great to try and get some information and turn that into a journal paper again to get it out there. But the next bit really is to try and get, yeah, as I said, you know, it's getting it out there. And that's really the, uh, you know, where you guys um, hopefully will come in. But I think it's really interesting thinking, you know, we we launched this not that long ago. Uh, there's a little graph there that sort of shows that we're, we're getting a fair number of hits. You know, it's, you know, there's a lot going on on the VCCC website. This is fairly niche. Um, but you can see, you know, we're getting an average of sort of three hits a day, which is not, which is not awful. Um, the other thing I think is actually quite is interesting, though, is what happens when those people go to the website and start looking at what is there. So um, for those that can read that, we've had 112 views, um, 74 users, which is a good thing. That means that people are repeat offenders. They, they come back. Um, and when they come back, they actually spend time. So a good couple of minutes going around, you know, the web page and looking at resources. And the bit that I'm actually really proud of is the fact that um, half of those users actually go and then download um, the, the information that we've provided. And I think that's massive. Um, but I think with, with a point that we can all appreciate, a lot of people have got a little bit of survey fatigue, especially after COVID. Uh, they were fun to do and now they're not. Um, we do actually on our website have a um, uh, an option that people can give us feedback on this. Um, and we, you know, so that's early on. So we know people are downloading it. We know they're interested. We would still like to get a bit more um, direct feedback. We've spoken to a couple of research offices and it would be great if, you know, we can have that way of knowing that their researchers are directly sort of uh, directed to this resource. Um, and get some feedback there, but that's sort of that's effectively next on our list, and that's really where I can sort of look at the numbers here and say I can see there's 444 participants. It would be fantastic if somebody said I'd be happy to do this. You know, reach out to us, um, and we can sort of you know work out some really nice simple way. The survey is already there, and it would be great to sort of um, look at that impact. Um, so finally, um, and I can. Uh, Share the link if anybody wants to. Um, that's an email link directly to our question uh, to to um to the website. Um, contact details for me are on there, and I'm sure Gordon can let you know. But um, my details, or I can share it in other communication. But it's really to sort of say, yeah, go along, have a look, 
happy to hear any feedback and would love to get involved if anybody wants to really evaluate this and, and take it to the next step. And that's it for me. Thank you. Um, thank you, Duncan. Um, you know, obviously, unleashing the power of social media is is key to recruiting. Um, mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I, I guess part of it is in the, the understanding or, or the comfort of ethics committees with the use of it. And I do like the idea of um, having a social media plan in the same way as one might have a data management plan. I think that makes yeah. things clearer. Duncan, can I ask you first, mm -hmm. um, you know, what given from your uh, from your your summary that that it's about uh, um, trying to make it more usable and providing mm -hmm. more confidence to researchers and HREX, you know, did you survey or do you have any idea whether HREX, either HREX or you know about have any problems with social media or is it more because they don't, un they, it hasn't been clearly defined of what is going to happen with the social media? Can you is, is, is there a C, all of the above? Um, I think, I think from, from what we, from the research that we did, I think it was really, yeah, there, that there is a definitely a level of uncertainty. Um, I think, I think Atrex are fairly, clear in what they want i mean that's what we got through speaking of heidi i think that that is the bit that is actually a lot clearer it's like don't we don't you don't need to get overly complicated with that social media plan we just want to know uh they just want to know you know are the investigators aware of it do they know what the risks are you know can they communicate those risks you know make sure you're not going to put a um advertise the um the trial on a website that's unmonitored you know just so really just being aware of where where you're targeting that that um recruitment and how you can sort of maybe control comments or that sort of stuff which is you know it seems a lot um more sensible to basically you know restrict comments on websites but i think i think there's a um yeah i, th I think there was a lot of appetite earlier on to sort of really just get things out there to lots of different, you know, put it on Facebook and see what happens. And we've really sort of brought that down to just sort of like, you know, if you do that, you can't necessarily control it. Um, and it's not a good idea um, for potential participants or for the, the research, researcher who's then got to, you know, control that messaging, you know, if that makes sense. But I think the, um, the ATREX are quite clear on what they want communicated now. And if they can explain that to the researchers, and um, you know, then it's a lot simpler conversation. Does that make sense? Oh, it absolutely does. Although I would put it the other way around and say it's up to the researcher to explain to the ethics committee what they're going to do. Yeah, you know what I mean. So um, I think, um, and just per your question about uh, risks, etc. You know, I assume that's in your in your guidance documents and your template. Yeah. To to provide yeah. Those two. Okay, a couple of questions for you, uh, Duncan, or comments as well. Mm. As a clinical trials coordinator, can you post the trials you're running in your personal social media, send information to friends via email? Does it need to be approved? Oh, that's probably more of an HREC question, and but yeah. feel free to answer it if you wish. Yes, I would say no. <laughs> I think, and it's and it's simple things when you start thinking about it. When you you know we we have to think about data data privacy if you're you know, and it's making people aware if you post it out, if you put a post out there for social media recruitment and then people, um, you know, are you identifying patients or will pay patients, potential participants identify themselves by responding to that, that advert? If they, you know, they might think, oh, that looks great for my friend Barry and then chuck in Barry's email and then you actually just advertise that Barry is, you know, might have cancer or might have diabetes or something else. So yes, trying to really restrict, you know, you want people to be aware of the adverse, um, but you know, you've got to think about how, who you are implicating if you're, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so uh, uh, short answer is yes, needs to be approved before you go and do it. Yes. Yeah. Um, Sandy uh, from Griffiths Uni HREC asks, curious about views on snowball recruitment using social media. Um. Yeah, I think I think it is like I said before. I, th I think you know you've got to get recruitment as early as possible. Um, you know, there are some really good examples of 
um, uh, social media having a, a massive impact on, um, or, you know, a huge impact on on recruitment. Um, but I think it, at the moment there's a number of missed opportunities, you know, because people are are, are you know unaware how to actually how to do it properly. I think that's a very good point. Uh, snowball sampling or snowball recruitment is 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 wonderful, uh, but you yeah. have to use it properly. And I think you'd have to explain that to the ethics committee if you yeah need yeah. to go down that road. Um, yeah.